Hold on, the bronze. Can you see me now, bronze? Look at me, toe cutter. Look at me. Wahoo! He's whacked right out of his skull, man. I love, I love the American. The American dub to me is home. That's that's like uh that's where it's at, man. The American dub. I just love, I love some of those lines, man. The night rider. I love Bubba's and Eddie's voice in the American. Perhaps it is a product of uh anxiety whatever i love the way he talks i want a whole bubba zanetti movie just of just called just called bubba there's no, called zanetti <laughs> that'd be really great that'd be really great where do we leave off when we were last reading the book max is about to go up against the night rider that's what i remember so let's that's chapter five so let's do it ready here we go Chapter five, Max, still up at the river, learnt from the next bracket of radio messages that he was the only one left. Roop had finally swallowed his pride, and as the Knight Rider continued to pull further and further ahead, he radioed to base. Big Bapa here, we're out of the game. Vehicle badly damaged. Mark Hare is in similar condition. Second, seconds later, March Hare confirmed Roop's message. The hoons injured, but were almost crippled. As far as we're concerned, there's no chance of wasting him unless he does it himself. Before the reply could be broadcast, Roop was back on the radio. Can you read me, Max? A crisp yes crackled out, out of their speaker. He's all yours, Max. He's a real horror show. Max didn't say a word. So in the movie, Charlie gets his throat cut and March Hare gets like, smashed the smithereens as i recall right so the book already the script that was not supposed to happen so there was a change already that's cool it was the night rider who picked up and used the frequency you should see the damage to him bronze he said with a laugh mental damage brain damage and damaged pride the toe cutter knows who i am max he'll tell you i'm the night rider i'm hotter than rolling dice man just step up and watch the kid lay down a rub rubber ribbon to the freedom just step up and watch the kid lay down a rubber ribbon to freedom just you and me and i'm winning max was in his car buckling on the harness putting on his lightly tinted glasses and kicking the motor over until it came to life with a healthy growl. One of his black gloved hands slipped the gear stick into first. The interceptor moved off easily towards the highway where Max guided it carefully to the side of the asphalt, the big motor idling, his fingers drumming on the steering wheel. He wouldn't have long to wait. The night rider was approaching him with all the speed at his disposal engine straining mind racing you want to get into some real sport bronze you want to know what it's like on the edge you're ready to go over it bronze max didn't move only his fingers kept up the drumbeat wrapping out a tattoo S wrapping out a tattoo small beads of perspiration dotted his upper lip as he glanced up towards the sun as it climbed higher into the sky Ripples of heat washed across the road. You listening, Bronze? You know who I am, don't you? Max's voice came soft across a couple miles, which he which separated them. Max's voice came soft across the couple miles, which separated them. I know who you are, boy. Maybe it was the shock of hearing Max speak, or maybe it was the calmness in the tone. But for the first time during the ride, the night rider felt a tremor in the pit of his stomach. This was no hysterical hoon cop. This was a pro. The best there was, they said. Max didn't take his eyes off the curve a mile or so away where he would first catch sight of his adversary. No expression played across his face as he waited, calmly counting out the seconds leading up to their rendezvous. Even when he saw the battered pirate cop car hurtling, hurtle round the bend, he didn't show any sign of emotion. Quickly, he engaged the engine, stamping on the accelerator, squealing the tires and throwing up a shower of gravel. With the tires biting on the tar, he swung down the highway, head on towards the Knight Rider, who picked him up immediately. Though he managed to grin, Max knew it was more for the girl as that. Though he managed to grin, Max knew it was more for the girl than any expression of confidence. 
So we see this on his face, the Knight Rider's face, when he like right before he crashes into the you know rocket, you know whatever the rocket explosion crash, um, we see him start to get really upset, like for no explicable reason in the movie, but in the book, in the book it's so clearly explained. The two cars were approaching each other with a collision speed in excess of 200 miles an hour. And at that speed, there is no room for either timidity or miscalculation. Max was guilty of neither. When the two cars were less than a heartbeat away, Max threw his wheel to the left, correctly, slightly, correctly, blah. Max threw his wheel to the left, corrected slightly, and let his rue bar clip the door handles off the side of the night riders vehicle wait he let his rue bar clip the door handles off the side of the night riders vehicle so he touched cars with the night rider he had barely overtaken what he had expertly threw his he had barely overtaken when he expertly threw his car in a 180 degree slide and with rubber sizzling swung around less than 40 yards behind the crazy so he does a maneuver where he's facing him head on, turns the car on a dime so that now he is chasing behind the car. The Knight Rider was tired and rattled now. This cop was good, mighty good. The two cars thundered down the highway, sliding around a long sweeping curve. But it was obvious that Max had the superior hunk of machinery around him. He crowded up, slipping in so close that his bumper and grill were lost to the Knight Rider's rear view mirror. So he's intimidating him. You know what's interesting? You know why there's so much here and so much nuance here as opposed to maybe in the movie? And I'm very curious to see if that's the same with the Road Warrior and the Th and Thunderdome. I'm, I believe there's a lot that's also left, as we said. But what I think differentiates Mad Max from the rest is that this is George Miller's first movie. And as we said, he was kind of inexperienced when he was making it. He wasn't able to shoot 15% of it. Perhaps this was an example of really great writing that could not be met yet, yet by the technical skill. Would, would George Miller, would Fury Road George Miller have been able to make this movie 150%? You know what I mean? Uh, so that's my hot take on reading this. And it's a shame that more of what's on the page did not make it onto the screen, in my opinion. The high was gone. The cop was too close, too alert for every mi minute change in speed and position. Duck and weave, break and accelerate. But it was as if the two cars were being controlled by the same driver. The night rider knew he was losing it. He could feel his mouth and throat become parched. The panic began to the panic began bleh, the panic began begin the panic begin to rise and the bowels loosen. Frantically, he tried to shake Max as the realization came to him that Max was the best he'd ever known. He could feel the tears start to st sting the corner of his eyes. That's what we see in the movie. His teeth were grinding and his knuckles bloodless. A low sob escaped his lips. That's all we get. So there's maybe more of that was filmed, but it was left on the cutting room floor. The girl looked at him with, a pan with panic written across every furrow in her brown. What's wrong, man? What is it? Babe, I've seen his face. It's not fooling no more. It's going. It's going. More by instinct than anything else, he kept the car thundering down the road and eating up a slight dip and then approaching a steep hill. Max made no attempt to overtake him. The night rider knew he could just sit there forever. Locked together, they roared up the hill, pistons overworking and every nut and bolt being tested to the limit of endurance and beyond. Man, I take it back. Great writing. The writing is great. The Knight Rider barely noticed the man standing just below the crest of the hill. If he had, he would. The Knight Rider barely noticed the man standing just below the crest of the hill. If he had, he would have seen that he was waving his hands in a desperate attempt to get the two cars to slow down. The Knight Rider wouldn't have cared even if he had heard the man's screams. Max saw him, and relying on nothing more than instinct of the road, he braked with all his might, his tires searing into the tar and his car coming to a screeching, screaming halt past the top of the rise. Max was just in time to see the night Rider shear the whole top of his car off as he hit the tray of a semi-trailer. 
jackknifed at an angle across the road. So there was an obstruction in the road. So when we see in the movie where the dude is waving is that's what's happening, but that's not very well, you know, communicated visually, but here it's so concise. So he hits the tray of a semi truck trailer. That's what the Knight Rider does. Jackknife at an angle across the road, maybe like this. Um, the battered police car was opened up like one of those old fashioned sardine cans as it plunged beneath the metal beams of the road train as what was left of it smashed into a set of multiple wheels on the far side of the tray. It simply disintegrated. My God, Max sat slumped over the wheel, barely, barely 20 yards from the rig, which had been the Knight Rider's executioner. His heart was pounding, the blood racing through his veins and popped them out on his forehead like a stylized roadmap. He heard rather than saw the driver of the rig running up the road, calling and cursing himself in hysterics. Seconds passed. Slowly, Max pulled himself back into his seat and unbuckled the harness. His breathing was labored and his movements heavy. He reached for the microphone. The night rider and his girl, he cleared his throat. <clears throat> They're wasted. Well and truly wasted. So they get decapitated by a fucking by the by the 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 you know the trucking bed of a of a semi. That's insane. So there's no big explosion like there is in the movie. And Max is like freaking out that like he came that close to having the same fate. The image flickered across the television screen as a camera panned the roadway over scattered pieces of what had once been a car to a shot of twisted junk wedged beneath a semi trailer. How would they have? How would he have managed to film that with the resources that he had? It was easier to do a really cool explosion. A disembodied voice gave the commentary: "The driver, who identified himself as the Night Rider, was wanted on a number of charges, including the murder of a police officer. He and his 15-year-old companion, a runaway from the Center for Juvenile Readjustment, wow, were killed instantly." A police spokesman said earlier today that it was the 18th time this year offenders have died while attempting a big run up the big street. We now cross to Richard Jameson for a look at tomorrow, tomorrow's weather. Jesse uncurled herself from the floor, disentangled her arms from Max's and clicked off the set. It was already night, but through the windows of the rambling waterboard house, she could pick out the white froth of the surf as a wave after, as wave after wave dashed itself against the rocks at the bottom of the cliff. The surrounding countryside was locked in darkness. The only lights were those gleaming from the house. A small spotlight cast a pool, a small spotlight cast a pool of light across the front drive. The spot illuminated the, the squat shape of Max's interceptor and behind it, Jesse's car, a low metallic finished street van complete with wide wheels, chrome exhaust and a spoiler. That's the, the red, that red car that they drive. Jesse knelt beside Max again as she took up a towel to rub his hair dry, asked the question that had been on her mind most of the evening. That was pretty rough out there today, that Knight Rider business. Max nuzzled the top of his head against the towel. Oh, no worse than any other big run. Easier, easier maybe. I didn't have to do anything. Just sit back and let him blow himself to pieces. So maybe it did kind of blow up a little bit. What's the trouble then? Why frown all through dinner? Just tired, I guess, honey. No other reason. I've got you and Sprog. Why should I worry? By the way, Sprog is the like an I guess Sprog is like a vernacular for like a toddler. It's like what you call it's like junior, like kid, like the ba like baby. That's what Sprog kind of means, from my understanding, from for Australian vernacular. He says, No other reason. I've got you and Sprog. Why should I worry? Max, that's crap. If it was Australian, be like, Max, that's crap. There's talk on the road. What sort of talk about your life expectancy? They're making a book on it. It's odds that you won't see a week. What happened out there today, Max? Max pulled his head out from the towel and turned to face her, squaring his shoulders and fixing her with his eyes. Who told you there was a book being run? Carol, Jim Goose's girl. She rang just before you got home to tell me that the Goose had told her. Don't you listen to Carol or anyone else. It's just street jive. Nothing more than people putting things together and coming up with the wrong answer. The hoon that brought it to that the hoon that bought it tonight had a tiny tattoo on his cheek, and you could see it in the movie. Some smart pen pusher at HQ suggested that it might be the sign of membership of a gang. That's all. Nothing more than a guess. And that some other smart arse cop hears that, and then some other smart arse smart ass cop 
Here's that while the crazy's going for the big run. He's talking all the time about somebody called the toe cutter. Before you know it, we got this huge gang headed by someone called the toe cutter that no one's ever heard of. And he's getting the troops together to make a big play for revenge. Revenge, Jesse said softly against you. So, wow. So like, man, that is so much. That's so that's so much more clear than what's in the movie. In the movie, the toe cutter gang just rolls into town. But here it's more like that, you know, they roll into town to collect their dead friend. But, you know, there's no talk about Max, about Max being the reason behind it. And here we're getting that. This is so interesting. So, wow. That, so he's explaining there's a gang that um, before you know it, we've got this huge gang here headed headed by someone called the toe cutter that no one's ever heard of. And that he's getting the troops together to make a big play for revenge. Revenge, Jesse said softly, against you, right? Don't start, Jess. The guy was babbling. He was loaded on pills, talking crap. There's no gang, no toe cutter. There won't be any revenge. Now let's drop it. But Max, but how would the toe cutter find out the news that fast if he's still alive on the run? You know what I mean? He's still on the big run when he was talking about the toe cutter. Who knows? But Max, I said, drop it, Jess. Jess put her arms round his neck and began to kiss him just below the ear, rubbing his cheek with her nose and darting her tongue in and out. Slowly, he turned towards her, slipping his hands beneath the hem of her dress and letting them wander up along her slim legs to the bottom of her pants. Jesse leaned to one side, putting him down on the rug with her, pulling, pulled him down on the rug with her and then slipped her arms through the shoulder ties of her frock. The top fell down, exposing her firm brown breasts and a pair of upright pink nipples. Brown breasts. So is Jessie is darker? Maybe she's like Aborigine if this is like in Australia. I don't know. Max gave a low playful. I don't know why they why it would be categorized as brown breasts. I don't know. Maybe she's black. Maybe she's, I don't know. Doesn't matter. I'm just just interesting compared to how she's cast in the movie. The top fell down, exposing her firm brown breasts and a pair of pink upright nipples maybe she's just very tan max gave a low playful growl and then let the towel he was wearing drop from his waist they woke together long past midnight still curled up on the rug the nighttime chill making their flesh crawl with goosebumps max stretched and tried to get the crick out of his neck by twisting it from side to side jesse began to laugh at his antics till max cut her short by leaping to his feet Holy hell, what's the time? I'm supposed to be on 3 a.m. patrol. I'm supposed to be on 3 a.m. patrol. He stumbled across the room to the coffee table, switching on the light and grabbing his watch. An hour late already. Get my stuff, will you, honey, while I can while I call into base. Jesse, still drugged by sleep, dragged herself upright. She began to lay Max's uniform out in the lounge room while her husband, still naked, unlocked the front door and headed for the car. Mad Max to base. I've been delayed at home. Anything doing? You there, Max? We've been trying to contact you. There's been an eight vehicle pileup on the Transcon, Section 23. Triple fatality already. Please proceed there immediately and assist. Oh, and Max, the chief's there. Copied you, base. On my way. So, wow. So he calls himself Mad Max. We never hear him call himself Mad Max once. We only know him as Mad Max by the, the title of the movies, but there's never any notion that his nickname is Mad Max. In fact, on his interceptor in the movie, it says the Dark One, which is actually his partner. I wonder if the Dark One's going to make an appearance here in this uh, in 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 the in the novelization. Max arrived at the scene as the tow truck, aka the meat wagon drivers, were carting away the last of the wreckage. Roop had had the situation well in hand. Already, traffic was starting to flow freely again along the superhighway. Max pulled his car alongside an almost identical interceptor, killed the engine, and walked around to the driver's side window of the other vehicle. A cop, a good 10 years older than Max, so that's probably about 35, was sitting behind the wheel watching his men operate. He was a big man with a thick neck, broad shoulders, and powerful forearms. He was also, Max never failed to note, very ugly. Hmm, I wonder who this is. This is Fief McAfee, his, his boss, boss, played by Roger Ward. His nose had been battered and bashed so many times it now sat squat and shapeless across his broad face, making the eyes appear far too close. Together and the mouth, sorry, 
making the eyes appear far too close together and the mouth too small to balance it. The ears protruded, given far more prominence than they deserved by the fact that his head was completely bald. As the name painted along the bottom edge of the one door testified, this was McAfee, the chief. I didn't expect to find you here, Chief, Max said as he leaned against the window. Without taking his eyes off the operation in front of him, McAfee replied, Don't expect you did, Max. Otherwise, you might have gotten your arse here a damn sight quicker. A damn sight quicker. See, that's the American dub, and it's the better, it's the superior delivery of of that character i'm sorry roger ward i just how i like it max wasn't perturbed by the reproach he knew that the chief wouldn't risk offending his top pursuit cop uh, uh, over a routine pileup i got tied up at home the chief grunted and then after a moment silence said i came up to see you max there's something i want to talk to you about let's take a walk McAfee swung his large, overweight body through the door of the interceptor, forcing Max to back off a pace or two and began to walk towards the darkness on the edge of the highway. Max swung around to follow in into step beside him. I don't know whether this is important or not, Max, but it's my job to keep you informed, I guess. Oh, that's right. He does in in the this is the scene where we find out about the toe cutter wanting revenge in the movie. That does happen. Uh, that does happen in the movie. My, I'm, I stand corrected. I don't know whether this is important or not, Max, but it's my job to keep you informed, I guess, the chief said, and without giving his patrolman a chance to reply, went on. You know that guy and his girl you rode down the other morning, the night rider on the big run? Well, we got a problem. What problem? It seems that his friends want to get even. The word's out that they're looking for whoever nailed him. Do you know that for sure, Max said, without a hint of emotion in, in his voice? Yeah, it seems pretty definite. A group of mo motorbike nomad trash. We haven't gotten any form on them, except that there's a lot of talk on the streets and in the pits about it. So those gangs, the, the, motor, the Armalite gangs, the motorbike nomad trash, that would eventually turn into the smegma crazies that we're going to meet in the Road Warrior, Mad Max 2. You heard of some guy called the Toe Cutter? I suppose I should have guessed the chief said. Oh, sorry. That's Max's line. My bad. Uh, you heard of some guy called the Toe Cutter? I suppose I should have guessed the chief said with a smile. You've heard already. Just a whisper. That's all. Well, I can't tell you very much. The Toe Cutter is supposed to be the leader, and he's making a lot of noise about wasting you. Thanks, Chief Max. Max said as he turned back to their cars, I'll add that to my death threat collection. That would be, that's a great name for a band, death threat collection. The chief let out a loud belly laugh and clapped Max on the back. You're a good kid, Max. One day you'll make a good cop. See, he says he's 10 years, the book says he's 10 years older, but in my mind, he's like 45 or even 55. He's an old grizzled veteran, like, like Roger Ward in the movie. Thanks again, Chief. I'm just not sure I'll get to live that long if you keep coming up to me trying to scare the daylights out of me. Have I got anything on now? The Chief asked and then answered his own question. How the hell would you know? You've been bawling our department time. Follow me down to HQ and I'll show you something that should interest you. Sort of a surprise, you could call it. Not a medal, I hope, boss. The Chief's laugh thundered out again, providing an eerie contrast to the scene of destruction barely 50 yards away. No chance of that, Max. Salary's the only recognition you'll ever get on the Transcon. The two men climbed into their cars. Almost in unison, the engines thundered to life, drawing attention of the knot of spectators away from the accident as they rode into the quickly fading night. Chapter 6. With barely five minutes between them, Max and the chief drew up a nose to bonnet the country, the court uh, with barely five minutes between them. Max and the chief drew up nose to bonnet the bonnet in. What does that mean? Drew up nose to bonnet in the courtyard of the huge multi-story building office known as main force air course, the halls of justice, of course, but more popularly referred to as cold. It's after the legendary castle. Interesting layer upon layer of windows stared out of the blank walls onto the courtyard turned into a shaft of life by 
shaft of light by the electricity burning over desks of hundreds of police officers toiling away in their futile attempt to handle the reams of paperwork, which by now had become the primary function of the cops. A few of them glanced out idly to see the hulking figure of the chief walking towards the main force workshop. A couple even recognized the cop at his side as the patrolman with the heavyweight reputation. Together, they walked through a rolled-up metal door and were greeted by a small man wearing greasy overalls and a ready smile. Oh, hello, Chief. Hi, Max. (laughs) Sucks Nitro. (laughs) I love that fucking guy in the movie. That's how he talks. kind of. Hello, Chief. Hi, Max. The chief nods, a greeting. <laughs> the chief nodded, a greeting Max while playfully punching the grease monkey in the chest. Mo- morning, Carby. Are you fellows here to expect it then? How do I know? Max replied. All the chief would say is that he's got a surprise for me. Well, it's quite a surprise, Car- <laughs> Carby said. He led them further into the bowels of the huge workshop, walking strangely favoring one leg and rolling his body, the legacy of an accident a long time ago, which had cost him his right forearm and left one leg slightly shorter than the other. Interesting. So he's he's missing a limb in the book as opposed to the movie. They walk past row after row of police cars in various states of disrepair through the equipment section where shelves stretched to the ceiling overburdened with the mechanical paraphernalia necessary to dress wounds inflicted by overzealous cops into the panel beating section, which was already aflame with the glow and smell of high powered oxy acetane equipment and out to a room, which Max had never even realized existed. Carby, I guess like carburetor Carby left them a second and flicked a switch to operate arc lights suspended from the ceiling. As Max's eyes adjusted to the harsh glare, he saw a lone car on chalks in the middle of the room. It was a police car, but only just. Oh, it was a pursuit special black on black. The bonnet was off. Okay. So the bonnet is, is like part of a car. The bonnet was off. That's the, the, oh, that's the, that's the, that's the, 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 the friggin', um, the lid, the pop, the, the hood. That's the hood. They called the bonnet is a hood. Sorry. The bonnet was off revealing the chromed V8 motor reflecting in the light in the blazing pinpoints. Highly chromed exhausts sweeped along its sides, flaring up at the back where it where a complicated system of spoilers guaranteed that its rear end would stay roadbound at almost any speed. Before Max had the chance to notice any more details, he saw he saw Carby climb up behind the wheel and hit the ignition with a thundering, roaring explosion. The engine roared to life, you know. When you see that, when you see the car for the first time in the movie, it's like Max looking at his destiny and it's like, it's beautiful, man. I'm not a car guy at all. I'm not a gearhead. I'm not a muscle car guy at all, but there's something about that fucking car and what it stands for. And I just, I fucking love it, man. The noise was awesome in the cavern of the workshop. And as it built towards a crescendo of naked power, as it built towards a crescendo of naked power, all Max could do was mouth obscenity. Behind the wheel, Carby was grinning like a child. Finally, he climbed down and walked back to join the chief and Max. She's the last of the V8s, Max. Probably the fastest car to ever come out of this workshop. <laughs> it's turbocharged with dismal valves, a full-face head, flow exhausts, twin overhead cams. It'll deliver 400 true horses at the wheels and sucks more methane than the department can probably afford. <laughs> Nothing could stop Carby now. The bitch is born to run. <laughs> I can't stop talking. Like the bitch is born to run. I've had her, <laughs> I've had her out once and I've never driven a car like that. She is like a child and accelerates like a monster. <laughs> Okay, Carby, Max interrupted. How the hell did you get this all together? Mm, you know, it just sort of fell into place. A piece from here, a piece from there. <laughs> a refinement now and again. Some modifications along the way. Gonna take me out for a ride, Carby? Sure, Max. Just let me get some wheels on it. As Carby limped off to find an assistant, the chief turned to face Max. It's yours, copper. Just look after it, will ya? 
before Max could answer, the chief was making his way across the room, calling over his shoulder. I'll be in my office when you get back. Come in and see me, okay? As the pursuit special rolled out of the workshop, its engine burbling happily, McAfee was standing high up at his office window, looking down into the courtyard. Standing next to him was a middle-aged man dressed in an ill-fitting gray suit and an old-fashioned narrow tie and a white shirt, which had obviously seen better days. I, th I think, McAfee said, we've got him, Mr. Commissioner. I hope so, McAfee. It's certainly an expensive exercise. I'm sure we have, sir. He was like a kid on Christmas morning when I told him it was his. He's already in love with it. Nothing will separate him from it. So they there's like a throwaway line or two about like about like, you know, um plying Max with candy, something like that. And you see that you see that like you see that in the in the movie, but it really comes into again very crystallized here they they are trying to keep max you know sa sated you know satiated or you know they're 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 trying to ploy him with 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 expensive wonderful gifts and toys like this this pursuit special right i hope so mccaffey it's an expensive exercise i'm sure we have i'm sure we have sir he was like a kid on christmas morning when i told him it was his he's already in love with it nothing will separate him from it that's your belief, McAfee. It's not necessarily mine. Nevertheless, I'm willing to follow your advice on this matter. However, I'd be less than honest if I didn't say it goes against my principles, to which I shall say by off an officer who you think may leave the force. It seems to me it's hardly necessary to try and seduce your top pursuit man with candy. That's the line. That's the line in the movie. It's. It seems to me it's hardly necessary to try and seduce your top pursuit car pursuit man with candy. Frankly, I think you may have overestimated this threat against him. Anybody who knew the chief well would have realized that he was furious, but he controlled his rage and answered in a tone which was nothing but respectful. This is Labatouche. He calls him La he's his name is actually Labatouche. It's not Mr. Commissioner. I have no doubt, Mr. Commissioner, that the threat against Max's life is no joke. I've dealt with too many death threats in the past not to realize the genuine article when I meet it. All of the information we've received in the last 24 hours confirms that the toe cutter and his cycle crazies are absolutely determined on revenge, either against Max or his family. What does Max think of the threat? What does Max think of the threat? I've told him, in, I've told him the short facts, Mr. Commissioner, but I've attempted to play down the whole matter. He's under the impression that it's just idle street gossip. However, I do know that there has been some pressure on him at home to leave the force. Combined with a feeling of disillusionment, it's my opinion that when he realizes just how serious the threat is, not only to himself, but especially to his family, he'll probably resign immediately and hightail it out of the area. And you think some pretty little car, some vehicle all dressed up like a Barbie doll, will make him change his mind? I think I understand my men, Mr. Commissioner. I think that car will be just enough to tip the scales in our favor. Well, I've said it before, McAfee, and I'll say it again. I don't enjoy wasting money, and I certainly don't, I don't enjoy equipping your men with fabulously expensive machinery just so they can have around the country uh, acting like liars. Just so they can go around the country acting like liars. I appreciate that, Mr. Commissioner. But the fact is, Max is the only man I have capable of effectively patrolling the final section of the transcon. I think we're both aware of the consequences if that rate of apprehension before the state line declines any further. The commissioner started out, the commissioner stared out of the window, watching the thundering machine disappear through the, the courtyard gates and out into the street. That chief is the only reason why I've agreed to this plan. Goodbye and good luck. All right, we're going to stop there and we'll pick it back up. So, you know, as I, I'm sorry, I could literally could not stop myself because it's just amazing to see the differences. The differences are it's you know, this is like the perfect kind of novelization in the sense that like there is there's just enough difference where it's like really interesting to like read it from like a very fresh perspective. But there's just enough similarity that I could really sort of visualize the movie. I would say that reading a novelization and I'll probably repeat this point in the future as we continue to read. Um, I, I think reading the novelization, uh, reading an, a really well-written novelization that's like slightly different, but 
similar enough where you can visualize it might be even better than, you know, the, you know, how they say like the book is the always better than the movie. Sure. But I think this might be even better because it allows you to sort of see what the movie, like you get to, it's like, you know what it is? Reading the novelization allows you to expand your imagination around the movie. Right. So it's like, I can, in, I can visualize the deleted scenes based on what I know from the movie in a world where you can't see any of the deleted scenes if they existed. Cause we've never gotten a Mad Max release where we get those special, you know, deleted sort of scenes. So this is, this really is, this is special, man. This is really special. And, you know, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, what other stuff besides like return of living dead and Mad Max that I would really like to read, like, you know, where it's like a movie that I really care so much about in the way that I care about Mad Max and, Return of Living Dead and all. I don't know. Maybe something will 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 pipe. I mean, I heard the Dawn of the Dead uh, book is actually novelization is is greatly different as well. So maybe that would be a good one to 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 seek out in the future. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. Uh, as you know, Riot Stickers is our sponsor, and we love Riot Stickers here. And I just want to tell you that you can get a thousand stickers for seventy nine dollars. When you go to ridestickers.com backslash from us, F-R-U-M-E-S-S, link will be down in the description. Take advantage of this deal. You're not going to find it anywhere else. You're literally not going to find it. These stickers are uh, have a UV coating that protects them from the sun, making them very weatherproof along with being printed on vinyl. That most certainly helps against protecting against the elements. Um, so check that out today. Riotstickers.com. Riot stickers, we're the bomb. Let me play play you out with our our very special riot stickers video and we will see you next time with chapters seven and eight of mad max the novelization peace hair grease